Welcome to the Kent Medway Growth Hub. Uh, I'm Martin Small. Uh, I'm a business advisor with the Growth Hub uh, and part of the team that's been manning the business support helpline uh, really since the end of March last year. So we're fast approaching the first anniversary. Um, uh, first and foremost, a little bit of housekeeping for everybody. Um, if your um, camera's on, if, if, you, if it's possible, We'd all like to see you eating your sandwiches. Um, the, uh, but if you'd like to um, mute your microphones, that will save any sort of uh, background noise or whatever coming in. Um, th there is a, a facility towards the end of a, of a, of a um, question and answer session, but it's uh, predominantly it's sort of information here. So if you have any questions that arise uh, during the presentation, perhaps you'd like to use the chat function and just put your question on there and we'll hopefully get to that at the end and, and, and hopefully cover all of those if we can. Uh, just a last note, of course, the, the session is being recorded, so it will be available. Um, so be careful what you all say. Um, so moving on, this is the, the latest event in, in a series that we've, um, we've, the Growth Hub have come up with, which is designed to um, help businesses that are in, either already involved in import or export, um, and in this particular case, in, 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 with a particular focus, obviously now on the, um, the, the new situation we all find ourselves in um, since we, uh, we left the EU. So um, just on, on uh, before I hand over to Graham, just first, my thanks please to um, Kent Victor Chamber for facilitating the, this, this event anyway, and also to Molly Hall, who is of particular help to old codgers like me, who've no idea how to run this sort of thing. I can just speak and that's about it. So thank you to her for that. Um, so today's event is very much aimed at those who are fairly new to either international trade and import and export, um, especially for, for those businesses that have been, um, uh, been, have been able to trade with the, the EU countries up until the end of December and now find themselves in a, in a very different situation, particularly as far as their, their documentation and so on is concerned. Um, so it's, it, I think it's fair to say that most people have found it quite a challenge. Um, so hopefully this will begin to at least um, throw some light on, on some of the new procedures that are required, particularly if you're at the early stage of, of your experience of that. Um, I think probably that's more than enough of me. So ex to explain further, I'll hand you over to my colleague, uh, Graham Card. He'll take you on from there. Uh, and uh, uh, towards the end, um, I've mentioned the, the business helpline there. Uh, we'll, we'll be giving you some details of the telephone number and the contact details. Uh, so if you have got any particular um, uh, uh, detailed questions, rather than trying to handle it through through this um, uh, forum, we'll, we'll actually be able to take those. You, you, you'll be able to make contact with the helpline and we can arrange for uh, either Graham or one of the other advisors to contact you uh, to, to go through your particular question. So uh, over to you, Graham. Thank you, Martin, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, in particular, Martin, thanks for um, volunteering to host for me, uh, and Molly, thanks for putting the, the show together, as it were. Um, what, uh, well, Martin's pretty much summed up the situation already, but what we're, we're aiming at, well, my brief for today from the Kenton Medway Growth Hub uh, has been to um, aim at companies, organisations, uh, sole traders, or, or companies indeed, or partnerships who find themselves suddenly as exporters or importers, whereas previously um, they've just been making a delivery to somewhere in the European Union or receiving um, a consignment from the European Union. What the uh, customs in uh, in the UK have called um, uh, arrivals um, for goods coming in or dispatches uh, for goods leaving the UK. Most people colloquially would still have called them exports or imports, but the great thing about them was uh, during the, um, uh, the currency of our membership of the European Union, the great thing was that there wasn't really a whole lot of documentation required because we were basically making home market deliveries or receiving um, deliveries from other people in our home market, if you like. Um, so what we've got is we've put together some um, 
basic information um, about a whole range of things that we think are likely to crop up and be um, a challenge for those people who are new to the game, as it were. Um, there's uh, one um, set of uh, PowerPoints, which I'm going to go through, PowerPoint slides, which I'm going to go through, which is headed as the, uh, the title has already suggested, a quick guide. Um, there is another one about pricing for export sales, which I'm going to pick a few slides out of if we've got time at the end. Um, and um, so as long as we're OK, Molly, I think you've already enabled my screen share, but I'm going to go straight onto screen share and go straight into. There we are. We're already there. Can everyone see that? Let me know if send me a little message if you can't. Um, so as we said, it's a quick guide. Um, the idea of calling it a quick guide is what we're trying to do in an hour and a half is distill a whole bunch of basic information, the sort of stuff that you would get if you um, attended uh, uh, the sort of courses an introduction to importing or an intro introduction to exporting, how to get going in international trade, those sort of things, the sort of courses that variously would run for half a day or even a whole day um, and um, be very informative, but we're looking to literally give you the bullet points for a wide range uh, of, of stuff. I'm going to use that technical term stuff because there's a heck of a lot of stuff going to come, uh, come through. Um, don't forget uh, questions. Um, I normally, when I'm presenting, I normally don't mind take, taking questions on the go, but in order for this to run on track, uh, I think it's going to be best if you use uh, the, the chat facility if you are putting in any questions. Um, the basis will be we'll, we'll look to try and have some question time at the end um, and we'll answer what we can or what we've got time for, but reserve the right, as it were, to, uh, to come back to you. So make sure when you're asking a question, if you would leave a contact um, phone number or email address, um, because at the end of the day, what we want is for people to get value from this situation. So I'm going to go straight into the first slide, which my laptop has decided to freeze on. So I might have to stop share, come out of it and go back into it, I think, because it's got stuck. Try again. This time around, hopefully. There, isn't life magic when it works? Um, so some basic stuff, as I said, we are literally aiming this at people who are new to the game. Um, the first thing to, to uh, if you'll pardon the pun, take on board um, is that whichever way we look at um, a freight, a consignment, a shipment, call it what you will, um, it's going to be basically be made up of seven stages. Um, whether you're the looking to be the importer or the exporter, um, it doesn't really matter, but we're going to take this from the exporter's premises because it's got to start somewhere. Um, so the, um, the shipment is going to go from the exporter's premises to the port or the depot, wherever it's being collated, um, consolidated or whatever's happening or loaded on a vessel. Um, so that's the first stage. When it arrives at that um, terminal or, or depot or port, it's going to be handled. And most of the time, you're going to see um, on an invoice, you're going to see uh, an item called THC or something like THC, which in this case stands for Terminal Handling Charges. Um, there will be a requirement for customs clearance, um, whether it's you as a UK exporter sending overseas uh, or whether indeed it's um, an overseas customer sending to you in the UK uh, or, or wherever you are. Uh, and I notice there are actually some um, attendees from outside of the British Isles. So I'm trying to be as eclectic as I can in my thinking, um, but there will be customs clearance required for export wherever the products or the goods uh, are leaving from. Um, Cargo is probably the technical term we should get used used to using. Um, then, then there will be the freight element. So the carriage of those goods, whether they're going by rail, by road, uh, by sea or by air, um, the 
common word that's used almost in almost all circumstances is freight. So what are the freight charges is a sort of question that you'll find people asking. Uh, and then upon arrival at the country of destination, um, there will be uh, customs clearance required in the same way, the, the reverse situation from customs clearance for export, there will be uh, a customs clearance requirement for importation. Uh, there will also be a handling requirement at the destination as well. So on an invoice, you might see uh, THC again, or import handling or something like that, but it, it's basically terminal handling charges. Uh, and then the product needs to get from, in the same way as it got from the exporter's premises to the port, it needs to go from the port or the depot or wherever it is to the final destination, um, which is going to be the customer's premises. And so um, it's going to be delivered or there's maybe invoices that refer to on carriage, the type of terminology a lot of people are using at the moment. Uh, involving the word delivery is DDP, which stands for delivered duty paid, and we're going to come across that sort of thing later. So that first slide probably gives um, most attendees um, a little bit of an idea as, as to the level. This, this, and I don't mean to be um, at all awkward here, but if you've come looking for really deep, in, um, um, advanced level international trade training, um, we have got other um, webinars we're going to provide on that subject. This is very much what I've described as level one or level two stuff. It's aimed at those companies that suddenly find that they're exporting where they weren't previously. Uh, so having said that, I'm looking at um, some situations from four different perspectives. Uh, I agonized over what's called the heading of this slide. I ended up with perspectives, which doesn't really mean anything. Um, but essentially what I'm saying is, okay, so from the perspective, from the perspective of the trader, what sort of things do they need to consider? From the perspective of the transport operator, once again, or, or from the perspective of whoever is involved in the transport, what needs to be considered? And the same with customs, engagement with customs, and the same with safety and security. So those are the, the areas that I'm particularly uh, looking at and making comments on. Uh, so in terms of trader, um, and to some extent, this is, a, this, this is a reference to, you know, maybe you might be reviewing your, uh, your shipping operation if you've got one already, or, or um, your European sales or something like that. This is, a, is to some extent about reviewing what's going on. Um, there should be for the trader, uh, and, and sometimes the documents involved are needed when there's things like a customs audit. So these may seem um, small points very often, but they're actually quite important in the overall scheme of things. Uh, so from the point of view of the trader, there will usually, or there should be a record of the purchase or the sales that's, the sale that's being made or the purchase that's being made from the, from the customer, uh, either by way of a purchase with a purchase order number uh, or some sort of sales information. Um, during that purchase or sale that's that's been agreed, uh, the INCO terms should be agreed. Now we're going to go into INCO terms in a little bit more detail. I know they've exercised a lot of people over a number of webinars and, and conversations I've had over the last months, and I'm I'm advised by my peers that everyone's been asked lots of questions about INCO terms. So we are going to. Um, make a point of returning to the subjects uh, again today. Um, the INCO terms, INCO terms actually is an abbreviation for international commercial terms. They are about the, the delivery terms agreed between the buyer and the seller. And um, essentially what they do <coughs> is they show when um, delivery takes place, if you like, when, when risk is handed from the seller to the buyer. Uh, and that can happen uh, in a number of different places along those stages that we just looked at earlier. Um, the trader also needs to be aware that there may be specific licensing requirements in terms of what they're doing. Um, so they need to consider, do I need an export license for this product? Do I need an import license to bring this item in? Do I need any special certification? Um, 
and the sort of special certification that that could be asked for maybe uh, to deal with such as uh, products of animal origin or um, or maybe something like a dual use situation um, dual use really is the sort of it crops up quite a lot actually it's surprising how many times it does where an item could be used in a perfectly benign uh, ordinary commercial way um, and yet uh, that same product could be part of uh, maybe a military weapon or something so it, it, it's it's a, it's about declaring what the product is and what you're doing with it and it is incumbent um, and I'm not sure whether we say this on any of the slides or not we probably will now that I've thought of it but it's incumbent upon exporter and importer to know what uh, to have a kind of an intimate knowledge of the transaction what the product is going to be used for where it's going and what it's what the ultimate destination is so rather than just saying we've got an order from Madrid so we're going to send the product to Madrid actually have a bit of an idea what your customer I suppose it's a know your customer situation have an idea what your customer is going to be using the product with you don't need to get right down into what's, what's the name and address of their customers um, but just know where the product's going to end up what it's going to be used for um, the trader will need to produce a commercial invoice um, and there's some must includes on the commercial invoice. There are there are often one or two other things, but the key things that should be shown on the commercial invoice are the details of the buyer, uh, the details of the seller, uh, the inco terms, those delivery terms we've already mentioned once already. The product information. Um, now, product information is a description, but also includes um, what's lovingly called the commodity code. Um, various people call the code numbers uh, using different names there is the uh, harmonized commodity code there's the tariff code they all mean the same thing uh, essentially what you've got is a tariff um, which is actually at the moment what we are using in the UK is called the UK global tariff uh, and um, the tariff is a record of every item that moves around the world really um, in, in almost all cases, you can be expecting it to be an eight digit number for um, an exported product and a 10 digit number for an imported product. And, and you can actually ascertain a pretty good description of what the product is by knowing what the tariff number is. The reason for majoring on that is because it's actually important that the buyer and the seller um, agree the tariff number is whatever the tariff number is in particular because um, with certain exceptions the the importing situation the tariff number dictates any import duty that may be charged on the products going into the importing country there needs to be a declaration of value now normally value is going to be related to the commercial invoice sale price um, but it's also important if for instance, if the goods are samples or, or, or goods for an exhibition or something like that, it's important to have a value for customs purposes. So the customs are advised of the value, uh, even if they're not actually being, being sold. And then any other references that, that may be required. Continuing on some documents the trader needs to consider. Um, there are, there's a, a packing list requirements in most cases, but it makes sense to have a packing list so that anyone can look at the documents and know what's in the boxes or what's on the pallets. Um, there then with customs, there's a requirement for um, an entry summary document, uh, declaration rather, which is known as an ENS, which um, gives an advance warning of products going to the port for export. Um, the export declaration itself gives proof of export um, and the import declaration gives um, uh, the details for things like local duties and VAT because the import declaration will have a value on it. Um, I think we mentioned it later, but whilst I'm talking about export declaration and proof of export, it's worth just uh, mentioning. In fact, I had a call this morning. I was speaking to uh, a company that um, has typically been shipping X works and I just made the points that um, they need to be careful that they actually have um, a proof of export from the customer because if they're shipping X works 
they uh, potentially could become liable for the VAT if they can't show that the goods actually left the country. So moving on, um, from the perspective of transport situation, there's, there are essentially documents that relate to uh, the movement of the goods. Um, if the goods are moving by sea, <coughs> it's usually going to be a bill of lading. The bill of lading is the carrier's receipt or the shipping operator's receipt uh, for the cargo. Um, if you're ever bored on a Sunday morning, um, you can always turn over a bill of lading and read the, uh, the reverse side of it. Um, and you get an extra couple of hours sleep. It's, uh, it's called the Hague Visby Rules. Um, and uh, I did sit exams on it many, many years ago. And it's, uh, as the Italians call it, multo stimulato, I think. Um, but as it has been recorded, I don't wish to appear too flippant. Um, the bill of lading is a very important document. Probably the most important thing the bill of lading does, which is worth covering right here, is it it gives title. So whereas every other document um, that's a transport document actually acknowledges receipt of cargo, um, bill of lading goes one step further and actually the holder of the bill of lading actually has, can show that they have, uh, if you like, ownership rights. They have title to the, to the product. Technically not ownership rights, but they have the right to be handling that product because they are presenting the bill of lading. So it's the shipping lines receipt for cargo, but it's so much more because it does give title, confers title onto the holder. Um, worth um, being becoming aware of, of uh, the CMR convention, um, and uh, I don't propose to go into great detail now because it's a very wide subject, but it's essentially about um, the movement of goods, the consignment of goods uh, by road not just in Europe, but in countries around Europe as well. Um, for anyone French who's involved, I hope I've spelt it correctly, but I believe I did uh, do that correctly. Um, there's also with uh, with air, there's an airway bill, which is the receipt, and there's also rail receipts. And then there are some hybrids, um, depending upon who's actually um, booked the cargo. For instance, you might see um, HAWB, uh, which is a house airway bill, um, and essentially what's happened there is one organisation has grouped together 10 or 15 shipments um, and has booked them with an airline uh, using one over overriding house, uh, one overriding airway bill rather, and then they've produced um, 10 or 15 individual airway bills for the individual consignments within that overall consolidation, which they're then calling a house airway bill. Um, so be aware that um, there are those different ways of, of acknowledging receipt of, of cargo. Then uh, looking at customs, um, what, a, what, a cust what do documents do for customs? Well, um, the documents identify the trader as the importer or the, or the exporter, I suppose. That's the main thing, really. Customs need to know who they're dealing with. Um, and depending upon the INCO terms, which we're going to refer to again on many occasions during this presentation, um, the importer or the exporter will de depend upon the terms shown on the document and customs can identify with who that party is. Um, it's important to stress the agent or the broker, um, if there's a customs agent or broker employed, acts on behalf of the trader, either the trader at the at, at either end of the transaction. Um, I referred earlier to the importance of the traders agreeing uh, the tariff number um, that is applied to the product. Uh, in actual fact, um, the agent or broker acting on behalf of the trader is exactly that. They're acting on behalf, relying upon information received from the importer or the exporter about the product and about what's happening with the shipment. And coming back to the tariff number, it is a misconception I come across quite often where um, companies think that the freight forwarder or the customer's broker or whoever they've engaged is going to tell them the tariff number of the product. Um, and the short answer to that is, well, they can help, they can assist, and they they will, because let's face it, we're all human beings, and naturally, we'll help if we can. Um, 
but there will be somewhere in the agreement with the broker where they say that ultimately they're relying, they're going to help you, but they're relying on you making your decision uh, about the information that they are relying upon. Um, obviously, the customs documents uh, help customs um, uh, deal with um, uh, mitigate situations such as uh, illegal tax evasion, for instance. And then we come again to the, com the comment about INCO terms, customs need to see correct use of INCO terms, they need an understanding of INCO terms in order to um, make sure that everything happens as it's supposed to. Um, and we are, if, if you're starting to get worried about this guy I keep mentioning INCO terms right now, we are going to go through INCO terms in some detail uh, in a little while. Um, the, uh, the other thing is to make the VAT the duty and the, and the and the proof comment actually that's one that I've referred to earlier, but seriously, proof of export is is key. The main proof of export is the customs export entry. Um, and I understand that is on paper or officially is the one that is really the only acceptable proof. Um, I can't speak for other countries in Europe, but I'm, I'm speaking for the UK market when I say that because that's the market that I'm, um, I'm mostly familiar with. Um, having said that, if for some reason you can't get hold of the export customs entry, it would be useful to have, excuse me just a minute, it would be useful to have some other proof such as the bill of lading from the shipping line uh, or the certificate of shipment uh, or whatever it may be. Um, but ultimately, uh, if you can't prove export, then you may be back in VAT territory, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so continuation of uh, customs comments. Um, worth mentioning uh, those of you who have been involved in um, exporting to Europe um, uh, over the last, or delivering to Europe, should I say, over the last few years, um, uh, there's been um, a requirement for what's called interest act reporting. Um, that although you might think that finishes or finished with the end of the EU transition period, I did double check the dates earlier, although I must say I notice things keep changing. We keep getting little um, bits of information that are slipped in every now and again where, where um, uh, dates do change, um, deadlines seem to be extended, um, and indeed I saw today that there's been a request for one of the deadlines to do with Northern Ireland to be extended. But nevertheless, as things stand at the moment, uh, therefore my understanding as at today is that interest stat reporting, although we've now uh, finished the EU transition period, interest stat reporting um, will be a requirement through to the 31st of December, in other words, to the end of this year. And then it won't be required after that. But it's probably a good idea just to say watch watch that space. Um, and a few sort of thoughts really, Inco incorrect documents can cause shipment delays. Yeah, you may say, well, that's obvious. Um, but the thing in the tail is um, storage costs. <clears throat> or there's a, there's a lovely word called demurrage, which derives originally from the French, um, but essentially um, demurrage is um, a, a an expensive storage cost. It's almost a penal storage cost. If if you consider any one of the port operations uh, around our shores or indeed the airports, they've got a finite amount of space. They can't afford to have a situation where um, cargo stacks up waiting while someone gets the documents right uh, or waiting while uh, questions are answered. So there's usually a, an amount of free waiting time, which is a reasonable period, depending on the port concerned. And then once you've got past that free waiting time, you start incurring uh, a form of storage charge, which is really another way of saying, please get rid of your goods because we've had them here long enough. And goods can be returned to the exporter if the paperwork is wrong. Um, income incorrect documents can affect access to special customs procedures. Uh, probably should have put an, a capital S on that because the, there is a whole area in uh, uh, gov.uk called special customs procedures, which is worth looking at, um, which involves things like temporary imports um, and uh, a variety of different um, 
procedures. Um, basically, um, the customs aren't going to be too happy with you if you're forever getting your documents being incorrectly done. Um, Commodity code tariff and restrictions. Well, I think we've referred to the commodity codes enough already, but the point is um, being made here. But if you do tap, in fact, you can just tap the commodity code number you've got into your Google bar, space bar. I do believe if you tap in eight cards, it will, uh, sorry, eight numbers, it will automatically know that you're asking about an export. And if you tap in the 10 digits, it will know that you're asking about an import. But anyway, if you tap in the commodity code tariff number um, and then go into the customs tariff itself and ask the questions, you will you will find information that includes whatever restrictions there may be on that product that refers to that tariff number. Okay, so a little bit more about customs. Um, you must show uh, value and the appropriate currency. Um, and it's worth also um, referring to um, the economic operator registration identification, which we're all lovingly known, knowing these days as EORI. Um, there are, um, I think most people have got themselves organized in terms of EORI these days, um, but um, maybe the thing to say is, if anyone, uh, my email chat, uh, sorry, my email address is on the end of this um, uh, slide set. Uh, if it's not in the chat already, I can put it in the chat um, later. And um, I'm happy to take um, any inquiries if there are still people wishing to get some advice on that. And also um, uh, the uh, Kent Medway Growth Hub have engaged the services um, of a lady called Sue Rathmel, who is helping with uh, what you might call the deeper VAT or customs requirements if, if things need uh, specific looking at. Um, so it, once again, there we are referring to, oh, we've even typed in co-terms incorrectly. Um, but I'll see if we can change that later. Um, Inco trims dictate customs dealings. Uh, the country of origin is important. It's worth bearing in mind um, that the free trade agreements that we've got at the moment with the European Union um, makes great reference to the country of origin. By country of origin, just to clarify something, we're talking about country of manufacture, country where the most manufacturing has been done is perhaps the best way of looking at it. So if um, if you in the UK buy something from a supplier in France, uh, but that supplier in France bought the item originally from China and it was made in China, then the country of origin is probably China, depending upon how much work was done on it in France. And it's a bit like that. It's, it's actually quite an involved subject. Um, the main thing to bear in mind in terms of the, um, uh, the free trade agreement that we have with the European Union is, is that the goods of UK origin are treated equally as if they were from the EU, and goods of EU origin are treated equally as if they were from the UK. Um, but be careful because it does depend where the products originated and how much work has been done on those products. And if you've got anything like that, you need to perhaps be a little bit careful about, we're happy to talk some more on that. And any licenses required should be referred to when dealing with customs. And there is also the whole area of preference to consider, which actually does refer back to country of origin to a very great extent, but there are various countries around the world that have made preferential trade agreements with the UK and also with the European Union. And we just need to be aware of who they are. Uh, or indeed we can help you if, uh, if you're not sure. So moving on to safety and security, um, to import um, 2GB before the goods arrive. Now I've put GB rather than UK because we are these days distinguishing a little bit. I hesitate to say it quite like that, but we are distinguishing between GB and Northern Ireland. But I say that very carefully, accepting that we are dealing with a marketplace, which is actually the great, which is actually the British Isles as an area 
which includes part of the European Union because Southern Ireland is part of the European Union, um, and that um, uh, the United Kingdom is actually technically, I think I'm right in saying that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So Great Britain being um, England, Scotland and Wales, and then Northern Ireland together with those other countries making up the UK. Uh, because of the uh, arrangements that have been put in place to deal with Northern Ireland, um, there are um, areas where we need to be able to, to distinguish between products coming into or leaving from GB and products coming into or leaving from Ireland uh, and indeed Northern Ireland. Um, and it's, it's actually a changing, a constantly changing situation as referred earlier, I understand I believe it may only be speculation at the moment, but I understand there's been an extension requested in terms of the current arrangements uh, with Northern Ireland. I don't think these slides refer to anywhere to the TSS, um, Trader Support Scheme. So I'll mention it now while I'm talking about Northern Ireland. If you are trading with Northern Ireland, um, there is a, a very good Trader Support Scheme that is operating. And if you, if you Google Trader, trader support scheme uh, basically you'll, you'll get straight through to uh, to the details of that scheme um, so to import into gb before the goods arrive the safety and security arrangements are needed from the first of july um, but they're not needed from ireland to export from gp um, they're needed uh, before all goods are exported um, uh, right now basically as of the 1st of january that that uh, passed 30 odd days ago um but if the product that's leaving gb is um an empty well, if say the product if the movement leaving gb is an empty vehicle going back to europe for instance or it's a transit situation uh, then special safety security um, arrangements aren't needed so moving on um We've talked a lot about INCO terms, um, and I'm now going to refer to them in some more detail. Uh, INCO terms are produced by, um, well, they, they, they're agreed around the world by traders around the world um, by the International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, International Chamber of Commerce, which I think we may or may not say later, is headquartered in Paris. Um, uh, there's a very active uh, ICC office in London. Um, I've had um, one or two exchanges uh, correspondence with some of the people who were involved in uh, putting ICC uh, Inco Terms 2020 together. And indeed, there was an Australian um, on the panel that I had a, um, a, a LinkedIn exchange with, I seem to recall. Um, so it's very much been uh, um, detail input um, around the world. Um, they look to reflect what's happening in the international trade arena. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a moving feast really, um, and certainly delivery terms have changed over the 40 plus years that I've been involved in trade. Um, and essentially INCO terms are reviewed usually every 10 years. Um, the last revision as I've referred to there was 2010. Um, these ones really are the first to distinguish between C freight and multimodal or other modes. What do I mean by that? What I really mean is that there are, there are 11 INCO terms and we're gonna go through them in, in a moment. Um, and those 11 INCO terms uh, are actually made up really of, uh, of four that are essentially sea, if you like, waterborne um, transport terms. Um, so they are aimed at what you might call pure sea freight, so the type of product that just would move by sea or barge um, uh, only. And when I say only, I'm taking it out of that description and putting into another area, the multimodal situations such as the container that loads um, uh, at a depot in Maidstone and so it's on the road until it goes up to Felixstowe and then it's put on the vessel in Felixstowe or it goes by rail um, part of the way or whatever. Those movements are known as multimodal these days and so the container type shipping isn't 
um, it's, it's suggested that that should not use the C freight terms um, or the INCO terms, that it should, it should use the multimodal terms. Um, and INCO terms 2020 um, now clarifies, clarifies that from the point of view of, of delivery. So um, I've used this slide recently in a Chamber of Commerce webinar, so some of you may have seen it, but I'll make no um, apology for using it again because I think it sums things up nicely. Um, agree in your contract what the delivery terms are. Um, and, and, and actually state it, delivery terms agreed shall be Inca terms 2020 revision, for instance. That's quite clear, nobody can argue with that. And be specific about what the terms are. So one of the terms we use is DAP, which stands for delivered at place. Um, name the place. In this case, the place is called warehouse. Put the address down. In this case, it's 123 ABC Street and the country and refer to Inco terms 2020. Anyone looking at the documents including customs um, can see quite clearly that the delivery is being made to a place at a named a named place at an agreed address and that will become even more clear later when we talk through DAP and a little bit more detail. Um, where sea freight is concerned my comment says suggest both ports are named in fact Bear in mind, sometimes there are transshipments as well. So all ports, any ports uh, should be named, not just on the bill of lading, um, but on documents um, that relate to the shipment. And, and my kind of caveat is Inco terms 2020 are no substitute for a proper contract of sale. That the Inco terms are about showing what the delivery arrangements are, when delivery takes place, when risk is passed from seller to buyer. Um, so there are 11 INCO terms, I think I've already mentioned that, um, and there are seven which relate to, uh, well, can be related to any mode of transport. Um, these are the ones that, that we're really talking about using outside of the sea freight situation, just to clarify that. Um, and we move progressively along a shipment. Um, so XWorks is, um, as the name suggests, X works. The goods are ready, are packed ready for export. That does include them being packed ready for export. Come and get the goods, please. And that's, it's as simple as that. Um, book yourself in if you have to. Um, and the next one down the line is FCA, and that's um, the, uh, the uh, seller agreeing to place the goods in the carrier's transport or in the customer's um, transport. Just going back and looking at those two in a bit more detail. Um, so the thing to bear in mind there with X Works is you're literally saying, here's our loading bay, come and get the goods. Um, and I know I've said this on courses before, but bear in mind that if you are saying, here's our loading bay, come and get the goods, and then you end up helping load the goods onto the carrier's transport, you're doing X Works Plus really, or you're doing FCA if you like. Um, and so you should really consider X Works is about just um, making the goods available for collection, and FCA is about actually helping load and secure, strap it down, whatever is needed, uh, the load to to be moved. Um, anyone who feels they have a little bit of an issue with that, don't want to go into a lot of detail now, but because it will slow us up. But um, I'm happy to have a conversation. Um, just email me and um, we, we can talk that through if it's if you suddenly think oh we're not doing that quite the way he's just talking about it um moving slightly along so carriage paid to um, now this is uh this is about naming the place where the goods are going to uh, and and saying okay we will get the goods to that destination um, and it doesn't include, it's important to say, it doesn't include insurance, which is just about saying, okay, we'll deliver the goods to whatever the name's destination is. Um, um, you can add insurance to that situation um, and then you would perhaps say CIP. Um, so carriage and insurance paid to that destination. Now that might be used, those two terms might be used, say for 
an air freight that's going to a, a, an airport, it could be anywhere, but let's say Houston uh, in Texas, for instance. Um, and if we then look at um, the, what are known as the delivered terms, um, which tend to be the ones that are most commonly used in the European market, the one that a lot of people are, are, are being pointed towards at the moment is delivered at place. Um, so what delivered at place means is literally a place, as per my example earlier, that's named. It's, there's no argument in, in, in the UK. I guess you have the postcode on there, for instance. It's quite clear what the place is and where the place is. And there are no arguments um, and the goods are delivered to that point. Now, the reason that, um, that I'm making quite a point of that is because if we skip the next one, but go on to the one after, and I'll come back to the, to the one we've just missed, but really the next thing along the line from delivered at place, um, to all intents and purposes with the acceptance that we've just passed one by, is delivered duty paid. Um, and that's what a lot of people have really been doing and a number of people being advised to move from DDP to DAP instead. Um, and the reason behind that is that if you are delivered duty, if your sale is delivered duty paid, you as the exporter are taking on the role of um, dealing with and accounting for any customs duty, uh, but in particular VAT, in the country of destination. Um, so um, the technical terminology that everyone's using these days is you become the importer of record. Uh, so if you say, well, you, and let's face it, DDP is its ultimate service to the customer. It's don't worry, Mr. or Mrs. Customer, we'll get the goods to you and you don't have to worry about anything. But price for doing that is you need to account for VAT in particular in the country of destination. Uh, so you'd need, well, you either, you'd either spend the VAT because it would be charged and you wouldn't get it back, or you'd need to be able to account for it in order to be able to reclaim it. Um, going back, oops, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Going back to DAP, if you've just agreed to deliver at place, but not get involved in duties and taxes, then you don't become the importer of record. You are literally just delivering to a place in the overseas importing country. Um, in the middle of those, there's one called DPU, which most people I don't think need to worry about too much, but it's worth being aware that it's there. As you can see, it's delivered at place, but it's also unloaded. So the transport delivering the goods needs to be equipped and prepared to unload the product as well. So for most of the people, um, attending today, I don't think that's necessarily going to be something that applies. It's, uh, it's the sort of thing that, that, that can come up every now and again. I'm not going to labour the point unless anyone's got particular questions about it. Um, moving on, um, just to touch on, because we're dealing probably mostly with, uh, with road transport situations, but I accept not exclusively, uh, I'm not going to skip over the C um, terms, but I'm just going to touch on them briefly. And by the way, for anyone who is literally very new to international trade and says, hold on a minute, there's 21 miles of sea between Dover and Calais, that's still regarded as a road movement. Just consider the last time you got on a ferry, were there some white lines on the deck of the ferry where you parked the car? It's a road movement. The fact that there's 21 miles of ferry is um, it's just it's just a fact. Um, so there are four, the other, the, we've seen seven, uh, the four that make up the other, the, the total of 11 INCO terms, which are, as uh, the name suggests there, for, for sea and inland waterways transport situations. Um, and these also move in a logical progression. There isn't an X works opportunity. The first um, uh, term where the exporter is doing the least is the exporter makes the cargo available alongside the vessel. Uh, now that's probably on the key, but it doesn't have to be. It may be in a barge. Um, and it's, but it was, we're sort of the sort of thing we're talking about. Anyone, anyone who's familiar with the uh, Shoreham docks down in uh, near Brighton would be a great example. A lot of um, um, 
minerals, coal, I think, uh, iron, all that type of product comes in, uh, if you like, in bulk as loose cargo. That's the sort of thing that we're talking about being loaded onto and off of vessels with these sort of terms. So FS, FAS, free alongside the ship, um, and it's, it's as simple as that. That's quite straightforward, really. Um, next stage along, including the cost of, it, if we go back to my comment about terminal handling, so the, the cost of loading on board the ship would be what uh, we were lovingly called THC earlier. Um, so the handling item um, gets the goods not just sold and taken to alongside the vessel, but also loaded on board the vessel. Um, and then the next two terms, this one does all of that, plus the goods actually go overseas to the overseas destination. And the, the, the price that's quoted includes the cost of the goods and the freight, but not the insurance. Um, and then finally, at CIF, the, the, the cost of the goods, the price of the freight, and also the insurance, and we're there talking about marine insurance. Now, just go back again, because we need to every now and again. Interestingly, in terms of delivery comments, where um, delivery uh, FAS is made alongside the vessel, delivery FOB is made on the vessel, um, delivery and risk, assumption of risk by the, um, uh, by the overseas customer at CFR and also CIF, as well as at FOB, um, is assumed by the customer on board the vessel. So the, if you like, it's almost as if to say the freight and the insurance have been provided as a bit of a courtesy. It's been booked, it's been paid for, it's included in the price. Um, but um, the, the risk in terms of delivery is, is assumed by the, by the buyer uh, at CFR at the port of departure, just as it is with FOB. Um, and although risk is kind of dealt with by the fact that there is a piece of insurance in the CIF price, it's a basic piece of marine insurance. I won't go into a lot of detail now, but I'm happy to talk about it in more detail in a specific case. Um, so um, just bear in mind that um, uh, the delivery uh, and the risk are the keys, especially in the CFA examples. Um, a few thoughts on basic um, export documents, and some of these are a summary of what we've already said, so I'm going to rattle through them. We've talked about the commercial indoors, but it is even more important than it ever used to be since we've left the European Union. Um, packing lists, I've mentioned that as well. Um, already, it's important to show the gross and the net weight on your documents uh, um, and also cubic measurement. Um, use work, working kilos and working cubic meters. Um, it's important to make sure you've got the correct transport documents. I've already referred to bills of lading uh, and airway bills before. Um, a word about insurance. Um, sometimes you can be asked for insurance policies. If you're doing a bit of a, a few shipments, or indeed if you speak with your freight forwarder, you can have a, an insurance certificate, which is uh, a cheaper option usually than an insurance policy, because an insurance policy is looking at a one-off situation, whereas a certificate will be prepared as part of an open cover insurance policy. Um, consider the uh, requirement occasionally for certificates of origin, and also things like inspection certificates, uh, dangerous goods notes um, worth being aware of if you have got dangerous goods. Um, in, uh, in air freight situations, there's a slightly different document to the IATA uh, dangerous note, but that they are essentially the same sort of thing. They tell carriers whether you've got a flammable, flammable item or a, or, or a corrosive item or whatever it is you may be shipping. And also things like health certificates, be aware of the need for those. Um, if you're, gonna, if you're looking at getting paid, um, broadly speaking, your options are cash in advance, which um, may or may not be attractive to your buyer. Um, on account probably will be attractive to your buyer, but may, not, may or may not be attractive to you. Um, you can ask your bank if you can do um, a cash or a documentary acceptance or collection, which basically 
means um, if you refer back to the uh, title comments I made about a bill of lading that um, uh, the bank will hand over the documents in exchange for the cargo. Um, and um, you can use a letter of credit as a form of guarantee if it's a large shipment to a, a country that you're not entirely comfortable with. We'll go into a lot of details with those on those things with anyone who particularly wants us to. Um, and also be aware of um, a, a document known as a bill of exchange or the bankers call it a draft. Um, but it's essentially um, a document which is made out by the seller telling the buyer that the buyer owes the seller a certain amount of money and the buyer accepts it uh, and then it becomes payable either uh, at sites or at an agreed, a fixed and determinable future time is, is the wording. Um, so happy to expand on those with anyone who wants me to. Um, a few reminders, there are um, embargoes and or sanctions kicking around. If you've got an order from North Korea or from Syria at the moment, um, have a careful look at what you're doing. You probably shouldn't have an order from there anyway, but just always be aware that you need to look at uh, whether your product should be being shipped to any particular country. Um, there are sometimes controlled goods, there are needs for export licenses. I mean, it's worth uh, at this stage making a plug for the freight forwarder. Um, um, I've worked with a lot of freight forwarders over many years and they are a very good source of information uh, and help. Um, and, but they do rely upon the exporter or the importer for the information that they provide as well. I've mentioned the commodity code, I won't go on about it again too much, but it is important to always keep in mind what the tariff number is of your product. Um, and proof of exports, um, I've already mentioned that as well. Um, be aware that customs are migrating. Um, I think it's, it's been a bit delayed here and there, and I think it's still um, not fully up and running, but um, the, the chief service or system that customs have been using has been gradually being migrated to a system called Customs Declaration Service or CDS for short. It's been run as a bit of a pilot in a few areas. Um, I've not been advised that it's fully up and running, so I don't think it is yet. Um, uh, it's, it, it's basically accessed through uh, gov.uk. Um, using a government gateway account. Um, it, when it's up and running and you're using it fully, it's possible to look at the complete, the complete um, paper trail of previous transactions and also apparently track the progress of your cargo on current shipments. But I've not seen that in action yet. Um, some information sources, um, the, um, uh, the in, 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 uh, International Chambers of Commerce, uh, I mentioned headquartered in Paris. Um, I can send these, these pieces of information to anyone who wants. Um, they've also got the London office, um, uh, which is listed there. Um, my business uh, shows up as, as a member of the ICC if anyone were to look me up. Um, and my business also shows, as, uh, or my personally I show up as a, a graduate of the Institute of Export if anyone looks me up. Um, and a couple of other comments that are worth making, a um, couple of useful um, information resources. Uh, one that is uh, run by a company called Kroner. Uh, used to be in uh, Surrey or South West London, I think they're now up in the Midlands somewhere. They were bought by a company called Walters Clure, I think. I'm not sure that's still the owner. But anyway, that's uh, extraneous detail. If you Google Kroner, um, and in fact, Google Kroner Export Guide, Kroner Import Guide and you will get the details. And another company, same thing really, uh, Tate's, if you Google Tate's Export Guide or Tate's Import Guide, um, once again, you would get their details. Tate's are in the progress or in the process of changing their name from Tate to something like Just Trade. Um, worth being aware of because uh, they their business is about giving you up-to-date information, what's needed with your documents for um, basically every country, you, if, you, if you're if you shipping to, uh, it doesn't matter which country you look at, um, uh, uh, any example, if you're shipping to Norway, um, you should be able to look up uh, on Tate's or Kroner's and find the, the current requirement documentation wise 
for that country and it will make it, it, they know and they will make reference to the fact that uh, Norway is not in the EU but has a trading agreement with the EU and everything that information wise that you get when you uh, go onto their site uh, will update you and give you whatever is the latest requirement documentation wise for that market. Um, a little bit of light reading. Um, I was going to put some document links in, but I thought I'd just let you Google them yourselves. Um, have a look at the, the whole subject of certificate of origin. Become familiar with it, um, not just because the Chamber of Commerce provides certificates of origin, but because different markets, as you extend your export reach uh, by different types of certificate of origin. Um, that light reading I mentioned earlier, the bills of lading, um, have a look at the Hague Visby rules. If you really do want to have a good serious read, it's, um, it's actually interesting. The main thing I suppose I would draw from it is that if the, if the cargo is threatening the ship, the cargo can be jettisoned. That's probably the, the key thing really. Your cargo could end up in the water to save the ship. That's quite important, really. Um, and I can, if anyone asks me, I don't um, uh, put it on as a link, um, but one of the um, long established um, shipping brokers, loading brokers around the UK uh, is a company called John Good Group. Um, and um, they, uh, I spoke to them a long time ago now, but um, we um, I have their, uh, permission to let you have the link to the John Good Logistics Glossary. I think it's, it's available on their website anyway, so it's not uh, much of an issue, but um, it's a glossary of shipping terms, which is, uh, is a useful read for anyone who is literally looking to get involved in trade from almost a starting point. Um, and there's my contact details, um, which uh, if Molly, maybe you could uh, give me the thumbs up if you've already put them in the chat. If you have, great. If you haven't, I'll just pop them in. Is that a thumbs up? No, it's a thumbs down. Okay, I'll put them in the chat in a moment. Um, and I'm just looking at um, time. I do want to just run through one more um, selection of slides. Now, it includes the INCO term slides that we've already looked at. So it, although it looks like there's a lot, there aren't that many because we won't go through the INCO terms again. Uh, so I'm going to go to stop share um, and then I'm going to go back into screen share and just put the other one up. Um, Graham, we've got about, um, we've got a half dozen or so uh, questions. Uh, some of them are a bit detailed, but perhaps if okay. we've got a little bit of time cover some of those okay i think that should be doable thank you martin um so just a few things to think of really if you're pricing for an overseas sale um so i'm not going to go deep into tariff classification because we've, we've talked about it but i'm just going to pick out a few points from something i did just a couple of months ago which i think are, are worth mentioning if you are quoting for export Consider not just the product price, but any test costs there may be, any inspection costs, because some overseas customers want an inspection conducted prior to goods being sent. Um, and obviously consider packing costs when you're quoting as well. And you do, as the exporter, need to pack for the appropriate um, method of transport. Um, and consider some of the extras that you don't always, always immediately think of, such as strapping that may be required. Um, and in terms of um, uh, conventional or multimodal, consider that um, uh, the, the packing type needed changes based upon the type of uh, transport that you're, you're employing as well. Um, in terms of freight, consider that in shipping terms, um, Shipping works on a weight or measure basis. Um, weight is one ton, thousand kilos. Measure is one cubic meters. Uh, and so if you're quoted a price, weight or measure, you're quoted per ton or per cubic meter, whichever is the greater. When you move to road, it's normally one ton being equivalent to three cubic meters as a pricing formula. It doesn't always have to be that way, but acts as a, a useful guide. And when you consider that a a road vehicle is probably taking around about 20 tonnes. 
and probably has around about 60 cubic meters of space. Then that's the reason why. Watch out for surcharges if you're pricing. There are loving little, lovely little surcharges. Bath is a bunker adjustment factor. If the price of oil goes up a lot, shipping lines will just increase their freight charge by adding a percentage called BAF or CAF for currency adjustment. Or sometimes if there's port congestion, they might add a port congestion charge. Um, marine insurance, if you're asked for full insurance, full insurance is 110% of the CIF or CIP value. Not 100%, but 110. You won't be accused of over-insuring. Those extra 10% are to allow for the costs of uh, whatever the disaster may be. Um, in terms of arrival, I don't think we need to go into this in a great detail because we've covered it already. Um, and in terms of my notes, I think we've also covered all of those, so I'm not going to labour that. We've talked about the tariff, so I'm not going to stay there. We've done it in co-terms, so I'm not going to stay there, which probably brings us to We've got those income information sources. Um, actually, what I'll do is I'll leave my, rather than messing around with the chat at the moment, as I'm asking questions, I'll just leave my contact details there for a minute or so. And um, yeah, back to you, Martin. If um, you've got Brilliant. half a dozen questions, we hopefully yep. got, we've got, we've got 10 minutes, 20, 20 minutes. Okay. Indeed. Um, well, thank you very much for that. That was a, a quick whistle through information that normally a, a shipping clerk will take about two or three years to learn. So, uh, so well done for that. Well done for even getting it down to that potted version. I have to, I, that brought back happy memories. The Kroner's Guide used to sit on everybody's bookshelf, little short, fat, blue document that you had a, an update about once every couple of weeks uh, of, of individual pages that had to be updated, uh, probably about half an inch thick each couple of weeks. And everybody always sat there, is always sitting there with a little blue book. And a, and a little pile of envelopes beside it, waiting for a rainy afternoon. Anyway, happy days. Uh, right, a couple of ones that came up, uh, a couple of questions that came off, off of the chat. Uh, first of just, all, um, see- yeah, Sorry, just, just sorry, if I'll just say, just to, by way of apology, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, okay. And um, uh, sorry, uh, you, I'll ask away and I'll, um, I'll put my details in the chat as well. Okay, uh, this one covers uh, CE marks. Uh, what did the participants uh, ex uh, export the gym equipment to Italy? And they've yeah. been asked for uh, details of the CE marks covering that equipment. Uh, I know CE marks is a, is a whole lecture on its own, but uh, a quick heads up on CE marks. Uh, well, the heads up is that CE marks um, are still, um, still the requirement in Europe. Um, and the organization asking the question may know that, that there's going to be a change in terms of marking for the UK market. What I would say is we've got uh, a webinar presentation. Um, uh, you may have details of the date or Molly may have, I don't know. Uh, I believe it's a March date where we've got trading standards uh, as one of the presenters, or it may be we've got a sort of a meet the experts thing in the middle of, middle of March. They are gonna be um, far, more adept at answering in depth a question about CE marks than I am. But but uh, CE marks, the CE marking system in Europe is still the same as the CE marking system was, but the marks in the UK uh, are moving over to something called, which I believe is called CA marks. Okay, so I thank think, you very much. I think it's, it's probably one to, um, and having said that, if, if the trading standards aren't involved in that presentation, uh, I am at liberty to make reference to a chap called Nathan Martin, who is at Trading Standards, who um, is happy to field inquiries about that sort of thing. Yeah, if you'd like to, if you want to, to um, really go into the detail of that, if you contact the Growth Hub helpline, the 0333 602 300 number, uh, we can actually put you in direct touch with with uh, Nathan at uh, and the Trading Standards and comes out the Environmental Health guys as well. So, um, so that may be something to, to catch up with later on. Um, another one, another question came in. Uh, what's the procedure if, and, and, and we're hearing it quite a lot at the moment with um, disputes, where you've got a dispute where you consider that uh, particularly the French or, or even German customs have uh, given a wrong decision on the uh, importation or, or whatever tariffs or taxes, whatever, 
are to be applied to your goods. What's the best way to, to, to have the, the best outcome? What's the best way to, or is there a facility, to be able to appeal or dispute um, uh, decisions by foreign customs? Well, appealing or disputing is difficult, but there is a system which is called the binding tariff agreement system, um, which I've got to say it's best if you're in there first and make the inquiry before it becomes a dispute. But um, if, I, if we go back to that stage first, if you've got some doubt about um, the tariff number of the product or the, or the proper description of the product, but in particular the tariff number, it's possible to make application to customs. You can see it on the website. Binding tariff decisions, I think, is the is the link they 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 show. But it will be binding tariff decisions or something like that. Um, and the decision that's then made about the product becomes then binding in in most countries. I can't say all countries because I think there are some exceptions. But for instance, if the UK makes a binding tariff decision on a product in the UK that same tariff number can then be employed and used on the same product in Germany. Um, and I only use Germany as an example because I've actually seen it happen that way. And I've seen the German customs decision happen where the UK customs authorities accept, have accepted the German decision. Um, if there's a dispute, uh, it probably comes more down to maybe wrong use of a tariff number or poor description. So it, it, whichever way you look at it, it comes back to, be ensure that in the first place, prior to shipment, part of the agreement process with the customer is that you get all your ducks in line at the beginning and you agree the product description is whatever it is and the tariff number that both parties agree on is whatever and you can check that in, in the tariff anyway. And the tariff number that applies in Europe is the same as the tariff number that applies in the UK. Does that, does that help? Yep, that's, that's fine. The, um, the next one is, uh, well, one of the, the of course, the, the tricky ones at the moment. Uh, participant's got a, a, a client in Northern Ireland who wants to ship goods via the, the UK to Poland. The client has an, an IE, Yori number, um, but who do they still have to, what's the situation as far as importing to Poland is concerned? To be honest, to be sure, I would, personally phone the Trader Support Service, which is set up to assist trade between Northern Ireland um, and, and GB, uh, and therefore by extension with the rest of Europe as well. Um, you said IE number, I think, um, but I think what yeah. you're probably talking about is the XI number, which is the number, yeah. which is the EORI number, the EORI prefix for, for Northern Ireland. Um, there isn't uh, an issue with products leaving Northern Ireland and coming to the UK, but obviously if it's going on to Poland, um, then there is, um, yeah, personally, that's one where if I got that inquiry, in fact, I'm happy to field the inquiry, but I would need to do the research to be sure that I was given the right answer. Hmm. Okay. This, this, that, uh, this that one that might even, be, might even be simpler, but rather than shipping it through GB to actually ship it through Southern Ireland into the EU that way? Then ship. Well, there's a growing uh, there's a growing number of services that are servicing mainland Europe um, to and from Southern Ireland, uh, mm. and indeed, I believe there's also Northern Ireland being looked at as well. Um, so, yeah, I I I should be careful to not to uh, not to advise against the logistics operators that are using the M6, <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it's it's at the end of the day, uh, one one needs to weigh up all the options. Um, and um, but in this case, I li literally uh, I would just just need to double check to be sure myself. But the okay. the trade trader, if you Google Trader Support Service, it's been set up excuse me specifically to facilitate a um, trade. Is it? There's, there's, a, there's a danger because of the slightly different arrangements for Northern Ireland, there's a danger that uh, trade may be um, affected, adversely affected. And I think the government, from what I can see, are doing their level best to, uh, to make sure or to mitigate that and make sure that, that there isn't an adverse effect. And one of those, probably the biggest measure, one of the biggest measures is the trader support service that they've set up. 
Okay. Thank you. Uh, next one there, which has actually come up a couple of times on the question. Um, somebody in the, in the UK is importing Chinese goods from a supplier or well, suppliers in France and Germany. Uh, how does that now affect the in, in, uh, VAT and any tariffs, etc., uh, as far as their goods are concerned? This is for, for retail. Uh, there's one or two questions on VAT, and I think somebody there has just put up the details of the 23rd of Feb about selling to consumers in the EU. But um, uh, VAT and so on, on on Chinese goods coming in via the EU? Well, they, they, they still need to be de they need to be declared for VAT purposes when they arrive. Um, but um, also um, they need to be declared as goods of Chinese origin. If they're manufactured in China, I forget which two countries you mentioned. One of them you said was France. So I can't remember the other one offhand. France and Germany. France and Germany. OK, so whether France or Germany, if the goods have come from China, um, they will have potentially been dutiable, uh, but they would have needed to be declared for duty um, in uh, when, when they arrived in France or Germany. Um, they still would need to be declared when they arrive in the UK as well. And potentially they could pay duty on arrival in France or Germany and then also pay duty on arrival in the UK. Um, now I'm not, and I wouldn't profess to be an expert on um, French or German customs, but if we were to reverse that situation by way of just helping with a bit of an answer, if goods were coming to the UK from China, being imported into the UK and then going off to France or Germany, uh, so exactly the reverse of what you've just described, um, they would potentially have to pay, and it depends, there may be a zero duty rate, but the chances are there will be import duty payable on the product coming from China to the UK. And then when it leaves the UK, potentially again, duty payable, uh, because it's still a, a product of Chinese origin when it arrives in France or Germany. Um, and there are, there are um, special procedures to deal with that. It can be treated as a temporary import um, uh, and so it's possible for the goods to come in to the UK free of import duty uh, on the understanding that customs have been notified that those goods are going to end up in France. Um, now, the reason I've said all of that is because I would expect that there is a similar arrangement available when goods are leaving France and coming to the UK, having started in China. But I can't absolutely confirm it because I'm not a French customs expert. Well, I'm not a UK customs expert either. Having said that, <laughs> I just uh, I mean, deal with it so often. I, you know, I've read it more times than uh, than than I read my Lady Bird books when I was a kid. Yeah, I think that's also one. If you if you'd like us to to go a bit deeper into that, if you'd like to make contact with the with the growth hub, we can get um, Sue Rathmull onto that. She she'd be able to sort out the VAT uh, situation as far as that particular transaction is concerned. Actually, it's worth adding there, um, uh, Martin, that I don't want to uh, confirm that Sue Rathmel is, Sue Rathmel is a, uh, a VAT and duty expert in Europe, because I don't know, it's up to her to say what her level of expertise is. Uh, but I do think it's, it's quite fair to describe her as a, a VAT and duty expert in the UK and her department. Uh, but I know that she has helped one or two companies uh, that I've pointed in her direction in terms of things like registering with VAT in Europe. So I think she would certainly have more to say usefully about Europe th than I can. And would probably, if she doesn't know, she'd probably know where to go to find the answer, I suspect. But well, we can we can but try. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Um, just to just clarify, I think I've, I've, uh, I've just seen a comment from Iris, which is probably in reference to that. Thank you, Graham, for answering that question. We'll send you the details about this one. So, um, okay. yeah. Perfect. Um, a little quickie, uh, multimodal uh, transport, does that include groupage as well as containers? Yes. Yep, brilliant, thank you. Uh, quite a lot of um, information coming through from Robert on the, the situation of trading with Northern Ireland, SPS rules and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that seems to be, I think we've seen that in some of the comments yeah. we've had you know, nationally really, that the, the Northern Ireland UK trade is, is is a bit of an issue at the moment, I think. Um, yeah. The other one, um, there was a question on, uh, this is terms of delivery, DDP transferring to DAP, 
Uh, how does that work with um, B2C <laughs> acronyms all around? B2C uh, 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 transactions at the moment, if you're actually selling to consumers in Europe. Uh, well, I suppose uh, the, the caveat I would put in right at the beginning is that, um, uh, well, it's not really a caveat, but the, but the, uh, the trailer I would run would be the tra trailer for the B2C webinar that the Chamber are putting together on February the, uh, I'll have a look in a second, I think it's February 23rd. 23rd, is it that one, I think? Yeah, um, so there is a webinar that is specifically aimed at B2C. Um, having said that, um, if it's B2C, then it, in, it may not be always the case, but in most situations, I would expect that there's going to be VAT payable at destination, which the customer um, is not going to be able to recover because uh, I'm working on the basis, I know you, it's dangerous to assume, but working on the basis they probably don't have a VAT registration of their own in the country of destination. So I would perhaps just consider the risk there that you may, as the export, end up sending goods on a B2C basis to a customer who then suddenly thinks, oh, I'm not paying all of that. Uh, and just doesn't accept the goods or sends them back or or, or whatever. Um, so it's certainly one to be sure of the facts on before you actually engage in too much B2C. Yeah. Okay, uh, one last one, then we'll do a little bit of a, a sort of summing up. Um, we sold some goods to a customer in October. They'd like, this is in the EU, I presume, they would like to send them back to us for some mod modifications under warranty. Where do we begin? Um, there are temporary import procedures um, available. Um, it's, it shows in, it, once again, it's in gov.uk. Um, uh, I'm not sure exactly which heading it will be under off the cuff, but there are special procedures for goods that are coming into the UK. It, it may not specifically be a thing called IP, which stands for inward processing, which is really more aimed, I think, at, uh, at a normal processing of manufacturing. But it, you'd be able to find the details if you looked under IP. So if you if you go into to, um, uh, gov.uk um, via the um, inward processing route, oh, my computer's just telling me I'm nearly out of battery, just one second. Um, yeah, sorry. So if, if, if you go into uh, gov.uk um, via the inward processing route, there will be, I'm sure it then gives you about five, six, maybe seven different options of different temporary situations. And one of those temporary situations can be the goods are coming into the UK for repair, under warranty or whatever it may be, and they're going to be re-exported. Because what you don't want to do is um, get caught out by paying duty on stuff that's already been exported in the past. Um, having said that, some of those press special procedures, they can be dealt with as one-offs, but if it's going to happen on a regular basis, uh, you probably need to register for those um, special procedures, which Brilliant. can be done once again via gov.uk. Yep. Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham, thank you very much indeed for sharing all that with us. Um, just enough time for a bit of shameless promotion of other services. Uh, the um, Kinder Victor Chamber of Commerce has two that might be of, of uh, use to everybody going forward. That's the, first of all, the Chamber Customs Service, which is all to do with the um, uh, uh, regulation, documentation, general hand, hand holding. Uh, added to that is also the Export De Documentation Service. So uh, with the facility, I think Graham mentioned earlier in the pre presentation that it has the facility to issue chambers, uh, Certificates of origin, sorry. So, so those are two. So, for those, yep. If you'd like to come get in touch with again, either the the if you want to do it through the Growth Hub helpline or or direct to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, there's the 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 helpline details there. Um, there was also through the British Chambers of Commerce. Uh, if you're looking at not necessarily there, there is a very active. In fact, we I was on a webinar yesterday where the Belgian uh, Chamber of, uh, or the British Chamber of Commerce in Belgium uh, for, it, it gives a lot of guidance on their website for um, uh, information about some of these little questions on importing into the EU, but through the, the British Chamber network, uh, through about uh, getting on for 70 countries around the, around the world, 
they have representative offices in those countries. So if you want a little bit of, uh, if you've got an inquiry coming in from uh, anywhere around the world and you want a little bit of local knowledge on uh, sort of customs and procedures, procedures and just doing business in those, um, that's again a very worthwhile resource to use. And if you'd like to make contact with them, by all means, come to the, the Chamber of Commerce um, and, and we'll be happy to put you in, in, in direct contact with those. Uh, other than that, yes, this is all brought to you by the, the uh, Kenton Medway Growth Hub. There's the contact number there. That's for everything to do with, with import, export, international trade in general, as well as, obviously, in these uh, worrying times, continuingly uh, uh, challenging times, there, we're there to, uh, to also help you with any questions or, or problems you have dealing with COVID or, almost as importantly, obviously, accessing some of the local authority grants and support that are available to help you going through these, uh, the, the, these, uh, the, these times and hopefully come out the other end trading. I've always used the, um, the scenario that really when, when now we've left uh, Europe and we're no longer a, a participant in the EU, really the British have got to get, get used to getting back into their little ships as we used to do in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, get back in our little ships and start going off around the world trading again. Um, obviously, once we get to the Far East, we'll probably get sunk by the Dutch, but um, there we are. That, that's life. That's the new scenario. And hopefully today has given you a, a little bit of a, a platform from which to say, yep, international trade is for me. Um, let's take it to the next stage. And, and if you need some further assistance on that, again, contact us. We're happy to help. Uh, and ladies Martin, and gentlemen. Could I, yep, Martin, could I just uh, add one last thing? Uh, actually, even before I add that, can I just observe that you... You said assistance in a lovely French way there. So um, uh, I think, but I just thought I'd add, um, if I may, that um, the, uh, for me, the, the European market is only just over there. And also the European holiday is also only just over there. And, and uh, we may have come out of the EU, but I'm looking forward to going to Europe as often as I can again in the future once the current pandemic situation is resolved yeah i think i mean actually at the at the end of the day as far as you know all the of course there are problems with with documentation and things that now in another few months where everybody will have got it all sorted out um those of those of you who have, are already trading internationally uh it really is only probably applying many of the same uh procedures you go through for international trade and now have to go apply to to the eu once everybody's got their head around the the, the individual bits of documentation and the, the new way of doing things, the world will continue to spin. There's still people out there in Europe as well as everywhere else, still people out there who want to trade with the UK uh, and want to buy our goods and want to sell us their goods. So um, these, these things will sort themselves out in the fullness of time. A little bit of a challenge for us all in between times, but we'll get around it. And uh, we'll look back in a year and go, what were we thinking about? There we go. And on that point, ladies and gentlemen, I think we're all done. Again, thank you to Graham for your huge input on this. It's very, very much appreciated. Lots of, um, lots of uh, thanks coming in on the chat there. Again, thank you to Molly for the technical support. Very valuable. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all hopefully again on the 23rd of February. Uh, take care. Have a nice rest of the afternoon. Thank you very much.